Good afternoon. I'm Caroline. Thanks for joining me. Um, I suspect that at this conference, you know, there's a lot of folks who are responsible for sort of doing application security. Uh, and folks are here to figure out, am I doing the right thing? Uh, how do I do something new? Um, how do I learn about something uh, that I might end up doing? Uh, and then there are some of us who are responsible for talking about application security. Um, and, and maybe you find yourself in both of those situations, both doing application security as well as having to talk about it. Um, and there's all sorts of people that you might need to talk about it with. Uh, maybe your boss, maybe your boss's boss, maybe a regulator or an auditor or a customer uh, who wants to know what you're doing in application security. Um, as folks were sort of trickling into the room, uh, I started with this slide um, from one of, uh, actually, our clients. Uh, my, I, we, I work for a consulting firm called Sigital. Uh, we specialize in software security. Uh, and this is what one of our clients had to say. You know, she said, a lot of people use this like red light, green light approach. You know, that's really a, a major oversimplification um, of what's going on typically. Um, another thing that happens is that um, you know, we overwhelm people with data. Uh, there's a lot of data, um, and if we present that data um, sort of unfiltered and without context, um, then perhaps we confuse the reader. Um, and I'd actually like to point out uh, what she says kind of at, at, at the bottom here. She says, you know, for most organizations, the red light, green light thing, the, the information overload, that doesn't work. Um, but, uh, and, and what if you do nothing? You know, then you have little to no understanding of the effectiveness of your application security program. Uh, and today, I'm really going to be talking about effectiveness of application security, uh, really meaning risk management. Uh, and we'll dive into that quite deeply. Um, so my name's Caroline. I've, I've been in information security now for, for a little more than a decade. Um, it's funny, I actually, the last time I was in Santa Monica, I realized as I was taking a cab from the airport this morning, um, was when I was in college and a bunch of my friends were going to UCLA. Um, so it was sort of a nice, a nice memory. Um, after college, uh, I, I worked in information security um, and, and about a decade ago found myself working at eBay as the chief of staff for the CISO at the time, Dave Cullinane. Um, and Dave was sort of one of those really brilliant leaders who had this ability to go to uh, the finance organization and the executive management of you know, eBay um, and say, look, we're not investing enough in security. Um, we have this platform where strangers transact on the internet. Security is a really big deal, and you guys aren't putting enough money into it. Uh, and they listened to him, and they gave him a bunch of money, and they gave him the opportunity to hire a bunch of headcount. Um, and he turned to me, and he said, Caroline, now that we've got the people, and now that we've got the technology, and we've got the projects in place, now what we need is the metrics to ensure ongoing investment in the program. You know, he said executives um, don't understand security. It's not their job to understand security. It's our job to understand security and tell them what they need to know. And he said, I, I need them to understand that this is not a one-time thing. Um, so that's kind of where my particular interest uh, in the subject started. Um, since that time, uh, I led information security teams at eBay and then at Zynga uh, before transitioning to what I jokingly refer to as the dark side uh, when I joined the vendor community uh, working in product management at Symantec uh, and for the past two and a half years doing management consulting at Sigital. Um, and, I, and I really enjoy consulting. Uh, for me, it's, it's very cool because I get to work with clients to solve really interesting problems, um, mostly uh, how to measure software security initiatives, uh, or how to build them, uh, or how to improve them. So today, we're going to talk about some questions that executives may ask. Uh, we're going to talk about AppSec capabilities and metrics that are associated with those capabilities. Um, I'm going to tell you some stories about metric scenarios uh, that I've seen our clients in, um, not all of which are you know, sort of optimized. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about my approach to developing key metrics, and we're going to go through a very detailed example. So uh, questions from executives. Um, more often than not, company executives ask the wrong questions about AppSec because 
company executives are on a plane, you know, they pick up Hemispheres magazine or a fortune and, and they read this blurb, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, a Jeep got hacked. Ashley Madison got hacked. You know, what does this mean for us? And then they think about the ways in which they measure other parts of their business and they try and apply that to AppSec and it doesn't quite fit. So if an executive said to you, <laughs> how does our bug count compare to that of our competitors? Uh, that might not only be a, a difficult question to answer, um, but perhaps you know the folks in this room know that that's that's really the wrong question to ask. You know, but but how how awkward is it to sit in front of potentially your CEO, you know, maybe your vice president of risk, you know, somebody who's kind of a big deal in the company, and say, that's not the right question to ask. But it is, and the reason is because, as we know, you know, my app is probably different from my competitor's app. Maybe it's written in a different language. Maybe it sits on a different technology stack. Maybe you know we have very different philosophies when it comes to the use of free and open source software for all sorts of reasons. Number one, our apps are probably different. Number two, our application security activities are probably very different. You know, Maybe I have an extremely mature static analysis program that I apply to our entire code base and my competitor does pen testing only on their critical applications once a year. You know, there's just there's no way to say our bug count, their bug count, anything useful. Um, another question that you know an exec asks because they don't know, and again, it's not their job to know, might be what's our mean time to recover from a security incident? You know, and maybe the intent is. Maybe we can make that better. Um, and we all want to recover from security incidents better, but probably if you have an incident response plan in place, if you know who to call for what kind of scenario, and maybe you're doing tabletop exercises to practice various types of incidents, you know, beyond that, the incident is beyond your control. Um, and so this is just, it, it's something you can't, you, you don't have control over it, there's not going to be any consistency in gathering this type of data. So um, what about when they're asking some of the right questions? Um, we've invested so much money into the AppSec program. What's the impact on our risk posture? What value are we getting out of the dollars spent? These are actually really legit questions to ask, um, but they're not easy to answer. And so today I want to talk about an approach to answering these types of questions. Um, Depending on how you're feeling, this could be like a like a I talk to you kind of talk, or this could be like a we talk to each other kind of talk. And it's completely up to you, because I have signed up to talk. Um, if you want, I'm curious to know what kinds of questions folks might be getting from, from their executives, you know, that might be easy or hard to answer. Anybody talking to executives and want to share? Talking to regulators want to share? Yes. Are we vulnerable to heart bleed? Maybe because they read about it in the news, maybe because their CIO buddy is worried about heart bleed. What are you doing about heart bleed? Which of course we know, sorry, I didn't mean to, I wanna to talk to you next. Um, which of course we know is software, application security is not just heart bleed. You know, there's so much more about it. Yes. Yeah, because, because, I mean, so this is interesting, maybe. Um, my sister is a pediatrician, and I am the new mom of a 10-month-old baby girl. And so when something happens, I will say to my sister, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried do I need to be? You know, and it's kind of the same thing, but, 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 but maybe not. You know, there's, there's a more detailed conversation that needs to take place. And maybe you give an answer, but then what? You know, you're like, well, we're a three out of 10. And they're like, well, why, you know, why is that? You know, like, so how does the rest of the conversation go? Um, cool. Any other questions from executives that might or might not be the right ones? Yeah, I guess why would you uh, keep getting the same type of feedback? Why does it keep, th why does the same thing keep happening to us again and again? And again, you know, some of that's in our control, some of it's not. 100% secure, that's a thing. Not really at all. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for education. Um, and it's unreasonable for us to expect that our executives understand application security. That's not their job, that's our job. Um, but they do trust us, uh, we hope, 
uh, to help educate them and, and to do the right thing. Thank you all for sharing. Um, it'll be like one of those we talk kind of sessions. Um, so why do you need metrics? Why would you consider doing metrics? Uh, executives want to know, bottom line, they want to know about risk management. And, and today's talk is all about how do you talk to them about AppSec and risk management. Uh, the easy way, the simple way, perhaps, one simple way is to say, look, good software helps our business. Bad software hurts our business. And if we can try and do things to make software good and prevent software from being bad, that's risk management. And that's, a really, that's actually a really good place to start. Um, but then what? How do we know we're doing the right things? How do we know if we're not doing enough? Um, when I was at Zynga, uh, we had a lot of really smart people on the team, and we were doing a lot of really smart things. Uh, but our CIO said, I know you guys are smart. How do I know you're doing the right things? And, and you know, we didn't have a great answer for her. And so she said, I want, I want us to follow the ISO framework, right? So one way is to choose an industry best practice or a framework and say, look, we're doing that. That's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, what I'm here to talk about is starting with risk management objectives. So if risk management for application security has to do with making software good and not bad, there's a lot that comes underneath it. And I actually have like a 20 point thing that we're gonna get to later in the slide that we're gonna go through. Um, but maybe you start out with saying, hey exec, here are some of our risk management objectives that are more detailed than we wanna make good software, bad software is bad. Then we can think about those risk management objectives and we can ask questions about how do we get there. Um, and finally, we can answer those questions with data based on whatever it is that we're doing, or, or maybe based on what we plan to be doing in the future. And maybe we could even use this to help us plan what we're gonna do in the future. So we're gonna do some vocabulary. Um, measurement versus metric, what's the difference? Um, Eric Basie, um, who did software security at EMC, uh, said, well, metric is you know, what they do in Europe. Um, here we measure things in inches, so ha. Huh. Um, a measurement is a value, right? It's probably like 70 degrees. Um, I had one cup of coffee this morning, which was not enough. Um, a metric is the aggregation of one or more measurements. A lot of metrics are gonna be ratios um, to create a piece of business intelligence. So a metric should answer a question. A metric should support a decision uh, and a metric probably has some environmental context. Otherwise, what's the point? Uh, so here's where we could talk about metrics if you guys want. Is anyone interested in sharing the types of metrics that they use today, if, if there are any? Number of bugs found generally. Yep, number of bugs found. Time to patch. Time to patch. Yep, percentage of systems unpatched versus patched. These are all good numbers to be collecting. And the last one is even kind of a ratio. Uh, percentage of developers that went through security training. Percentage of developers went through security training. Percentage, that's a ratio. Cool, thank you guys. Um, harder question, maybe. What types of questions and decisions do these measurements help to support? Further training slash uh, what uh, for, uh, manager issues go to the coaching. Yeah. What do we do next? How do we expand our training coverage? What are you going to give me more money to do next year? Cool. Thank you guys. Um, so there's lots of different phases to doing metrics. Um, first, you have to figure out what they're going to be. You have to define what they are. And then you get some data. Maybe you put it in a dashboard, uh, and, then you, and then you talk to people about it. Um, today, we're really only talking about this first part. I think it's really important to get the first part right uh, and to figure out what, how, do, how do you define your metric. Um, the rest of it, there's, there's all sorts of interesting 
things about uh, phase two and phase three, but today we're talking about phase one. So this is a slide that I put together um, and it's just, you know, a way that people grow in AppSec. Um, a lot of folks start out looking for and finding defects. Um, maybe they evolve to a point where they require that you do some defect discovery. Maybe certain types of defect discovery are required at different times under different situations. You know, for example, high risk apps need to have more defect discovery, low risk apps, you know, need to have less. Um, maybe certain types of defect discovery need, need to happen on a periodic basis, whether that be quarterly or a year um, or once every three years. Um, you know, some organizations, once they're looking for stuff, finding it, requiring that you look for stuff and find it, um, you know, get to a point where they're fixing it. I think a lot of us in this room know that those are, those are not always, it's not always a, um, a fair assumption to say that just because we're looking for problems, we're also fixing them. Um, but some organizations, you know, grow uh, along this maturity curve and get to a place where they're fixing them. Uh, and then finally, you know, some people are preventing defects. And this is not necessarily like a, this is the way or this is the one way, um, but these are some ways in which uh, application security programs grow. Uh, and correspondingly, you know, I think that metrics should change and should grow accordingly. So if you're looking for defects, you know, maybe it's interesting to say, well, how many of our development teams are participating in whatever sort of defect discovery? How much coverage do we have? Um, you know, later when you're requiring it of people, um, you know, who's, who's meeting our requirements? You know, if we have requirements around fixes, you know, maybe you have, um, you know, remediation timeframes uh, that are associated with severity of defects. Um, and then, you know, you could get to things like effectiveness. We've got a penetration testing capability. How effective is that capability? What does that mean for us? Uh, and then finally, uh, risk prevention metrics. You know, maybe we've got like a top N bugs list. You know, these are the top classes of bugs that we tend to find in our code base. Maybe we'll take the top one or the top two and we're really gonna target our training, you know, to teach engineers, you know, this is a type of bug that you need to know about. You need to know how not to introduce it into code. If it is, if you find it, you know, this is how you fix it. Um, and maybe you even do things like builds, you know, custom static analysis rules to find it uh, automatically with tools. So I didn't like, I didn't put like headers in here. Um, but the next section of this talk, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, some example scenarios uh, that I find um, people in when, they, when they're doing metrics. Um, and maybe these are, for the most part, not the ideal scenarios. Um, one of them is uh, when, when something bad happens. Um, and the first, uh, so this is an executive question, right? The ex something bad happens and the executive wants to know what happened, how do we stop it, you know, and, and what do I tell people about it? You know, maybe it's in the news. Um, maybe our regulator has a lot of questions for us. Maybe internal audit has a lot of questions for us. What do I tell people? Um, and then, and then the, the response is usually, well, this is what we're going to do in the future. And, and what we're going to do in the future is usually some sort of minimum baseline. You know, here's the standard of due care. Um, you know, maybe we're going to pen test all of our apps that have regulated information in it, um, you know, once a quarter. And then we're just gonna do that. And then, and then there becomes sort of this idea that maybe AppSec is only pen testing the most critical apps once a quarter. That's it. Um, so that's one scenario. And maybe, you know, every quarter the executive says, you know, can I have the pretty graph that shows that we in fact did our pen testing of our most critical apps this quarter, you know? Um, sure, but, but, but it's not really useful. It's not really managing risk better. Uh, scenario, scenario two uh, is what I call vanity metrics. So in this case, um, folks are counting things. Um, so for example, you know, we've got eight people on our team. Uh, we spent 109% of this year's budget. Um, and last week we found 12 bugs. Okay, so what? 
Um, you know, this app, you know, we found six defects, and on a scale of one to five, they're each a level two. So we're going to add that up. That's 12, and that's yellow colored, you know? Um, and a lot of people find themselves in this situation because they're like, I want to talk about my program, I want to talk about it in a quantitative manner, um, but maybe what's missing is um, some context, you know, and some meaning um, and, and, and something that could be used to, to drive action. So when this situation gets pretty bad, which sometimes it does, um, then AppSec is counting a lot of things. Um, I've, I've worked with clients who produce like 300 slide PowerPoint decks full of numbers and they're measuring everything, but they're not really saying that much. Um, and so without context, maybe there's not understanding on the part of the reader or the executive that you're giving this 300 page PowerPoint deck to. Who has time to read 300 pages of PowerPoint? Much less, you know, every quarter or every year. Probably not, probably it's not being read. Maybe it's just being ignored. Um, and the other thing about sort of scenarios 2A and 2B um, is that without context and sort of a narrative to accompany some of these numbers, um, you know, what could happen is the executive or whoever you're talking to might respond positively or they might respond negatively. How do I know that 12 defects is a good thing or a bad thing? I, I have no idea. I have no idea how to react um, and I'm just going to react uh, and then we'll go from there. Not ideal. Um, and then, you know, maybe this goes on for long enough that you get to a point where, you know, AppSec is talking about stuff and, and it's just being totally tuned out. You know, um, I've worked with clients who say, you know, we've got metrics uh, and, we're, and we're talking to people about it. You know, we're giving it to our executive risk committee and we're giving it to internal audit. Um, and we'd like you to come in and, and take a look at our metrics and give us some advice. You know, one of the things that I like to do is go talk to internal audit and go talk to the executive risk committee and say, so what kind of metrics are you getting from AppSec? And they're like, metrics? We're not getting metrics. And AppSec is like, we send them this report every week. It's in their email, you know, but, but they're not reading it. Um, or, or maybe, you know, in a, in a not great scenario, which actually happened to my client who had that quote on the first page, um, maybe they just stopped, you know, attending your meetings and they just don't show up because they're like, why would I go to this meeting? I have no idea, you know, I don't know what they're saying. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. And then finally, you know, maybe, um, maybe if you are being effective at, 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 at at doing metrics, you know, there's there's an opportunity to to go to executives and say, look, here's our plan, here's our progress against that plan. I'm going to let you know if there are any issues or any risks. You know, um, hey, we found nine critical bugs this month. That was expected because we just rolled out a new defect discovery capability. Uh, we consider that to be acceptable because the bugs were found in development and not in production. And remedi remediation tasks have been assigned, and it looks like all the bugs are going to be fixed within the recommended time. So we found nine critical bugs, but we're letting you know that, that we have a plan and that that was a good thing that we found them in the first place. So um, sort of in the beginning of this talk, uh, I talked about risk management. Risk management is about making good software because good software makes better business and avoiding bad software because bad software hurts the business. Um, and so how do we get to more detailed than good software, good, bad software, bad? Um, so well, we've thought about this a lot. And so we have like 20 or so risk management objectives that I wanna share with you. Um, the way that we talk, the way that I think about metrics, the way that Sigital thinks about metrics is to start with these objectives um, and then to look at, okay, well, what are we doing, you know, against those objectives? And then use that to say, well, here are some metrics. Okay, so we talked about this already. Um, so some objectives, and on this slide, we've got six objectives. So you could go to your exec and maybe, you know, you care about all these six, maybe you don't, but here's six that you can pick from and talk to that's, that's, that's more detailed than Good software, good, bad software, bad. Um, so maybe you can go to your executive and say, look, 
we are not appropriately managing AppSec risk if we are not doing the following things. And this particular slide is all about visibility into the portfolio because most organizations have more than one app. Most organizations have more than one piece of software. And for the AppSec people, you know, sometimes there's this focus on like, okay, critical apps, high risk apps, what about all the rest of the apps? Or maybe there's just one more app, but if there are apps that we're not doing anything to from a software security perspective, maybe that's something to be concerned about. Even if the thing that we do is to evaluate that piece of software, designate it as low risk, and decide that you're not going to do anything about it. But this says, if we're going to do risk management, then maybe we should know all the software in our portfolio. Maybe we should know, um, you know, and maybe that includes you know, open source software. Um, maybe we should be able to enumerate our applications and our databases, and maybe that includes knowing where all the sensitive information is stored or processed. Uh, maybe we should um, make sure that we know what the appropriate security posture is for every application. Um, maybe we should, for every, ass every software asset, have a risk ranking assigned for every software project, have an impact rating assigned. For every software security defect, have a severity rating assigned. For every data asset, have a, have a classification assigned. Um, maybe we need to be managing risk across the entire portfolio and not just this tiny part of our portfolio that's the critical apps um, so that we can provide a complete risk picture to executive management. And I'm not saying that if you're not doing this, you're not doing your job. Application security is this thing that grows and it matures, but maybe this is something that we can strive to. Because we're, if we're talking about a risk management objective, then, then maybe we can set that bar quite high and then put together a plan to get there. Um, the next set of risk management objectives have to do with a secure software development lifecycle. So maybe every project goes through uh, this secure software development lifecycle um, maybe we're making sure that we're doing appropriate levels of defect discovery and that, you know, appropriate is sort of this term um, that allows you to not have to do everything to everything, um, but you can apply various controls in a risk-based manner. Um, you want to make sure that your defects are documented and that they're fixed and that variances, any exceptions to remediating defects are documented and tracked. We'd like to tune our secure SDLC so that we're not pissing off engineering and so that we're going as fast as engineering needs us to go. Um, we want to move efforts left in the secure software development lifecycle so that we're maximizing our prevention efforts. We want to analyze the risk associated with hundreds of medium security defects in production. You know, a lot of organizations say, well, we're going to fix the critical defects if we have time, we'll fix the high defects, you know, but as far as medium or low severity defects go, you know, we're, we're not going to get to that in 10 years. There's just not enough time. You know, but maybe if we're holding ourselves to a really high bar when we're talking about risk management objectives, then we could even think about considering if there's like hundreds of medium severity defects and we're not doing anything about that, you know, should we think about that? Um, using threat and attack intelligence to continually improve um, our secure SDLC. So this next, uh, we've thought about this a lot, so there's like a lot of objectives we're going to talk about. Um, this next set has to do with policy, standards, and out outreach. So what's sort of expected behavior? How do we talk to people internally about what we're doing? Um, we may not be appropriately managing the risk if we don't have policies and standards, if we're not incorporating every stakeholder in the software security strategy, so maybe we're not just talking about developers, maybe we're talking about QA folks, architects, project managers, business analysts, um, you know, IT folks who are deploying the software environments that our application is going to sit on. Um, maybe we're not appropriately managing our application security risk if we're not you, you know, reaching out to talk to executives about it and talking to all the rest of the stakeholders about it, maybe you know, less technical for executives, more technical for everyone else, and ensuring that all stakeholders have the appropriate level of training. Um, and finally, 
when it comes to risk management of um, application security, you know, there's, there's other things other than the application, other than the software uh, that we have to worry about sometimes, the software environment, making sure that, you know, the IT team who's deploying the software environment that my application sits on is not screwing things up for me, um, and also making sure that the software vendors that I work with who provide me with software um, are not screwing things up for me. Uh, and finally, you know, making sure that, you know, if, if we're really talking about risk management, maybe we're going beyond compliance and maybe we even have metrics uh, to talk about what we're doing. So the next thing, once we figure out what our risk management objectives are going to be, uh, might be to say, well, what are we doing today and, and what are we going to do tomorrow? Uh, and this is, um, for anyone who saw Dell's talk earlier this morning, um, sort of 20 software security capabilities. What are some things that you could do for AppSec? Uh, it's not just pen testing, you know, pen testing being one of, I think we've got like six or so defect discovery methods listed here. Um, but there's other stuff that, that people do in AppSec, uh, and here's a list of all the things that we could think of. So here's where sort of the rubber meets the road. Um, and we talked about 20 or so AppSec risk management objectives. Um, I'm taking one of those. So this one says, we are not appropriately managing AppSec risk if we are not guiding every software project through a secure SDLC that, det that determines whether the software is acceptably secure. So what is a secure SDLC? You know, at a very bare minimum, maybe there are two gates in our secure SDLC, one that says permit to build and one that says permit to deploy. Maybe the permit to build gate says, you know, we're going to evaluate the risk of this particular software asset. And depending on if it's high risk, medium risk, low risk, you know, we're going to dictate that certain types of controls be applied. Maybe more controls for the high risk apps, maybe fewer controls for the low risk apps, maybe different controls, maybe cheaper controls for the low risk apps. Um, and then you've got your permit to deploy gate that says, well, you know, if you did some threat modeling or some architecture risk analysis and you identified some flaws, you know, did you actually fix those? You know, we want to check that before we go live. Or if you found some bugs in static analysis and you're supposed to fix them, you know, we want to make sure that those got fixed before we go live. Um, if you were supposed to use some secure libraries or, or adhere to some secure requirements, we want to make sure. So a secure SDLC um, sort of at a minimum, perhaps, is a permit to build and a permit to deploy uh, checkpoint. So that's just one example of how you could do it. Um, so given this risk management objective, of which we talked about 20, um, you know, here I'm going to share with you uh, maybe five or so questions uh, that, that ask about that risk management objective. Um, and the data that answers these questions, hopefully, actually begins to paint a picture of what's our risk situation and how are we managing that risk in a way that's more interesting than good software good, bad software bad. How many, what percentage of the applications in the portfolio have been reviewed and signed off indicating an, an acceptable level of security? So because we're talking a percentage, we've got a ratio. Um, and there's also ways to kind of slice and dice that data so that you can really zero in on problem areas. Um, maybe you could look at it according to different risk rankings of applications, or maybe just one risk ranking. What about just our critical risk applications um, per, for various technology stacks across different business units, for different software project types, you know, internally developed COTS, you know, free and open source software. Um, so, the idea being that you've got your risk management objective, you've got, you've got a question about that risk management objective, and if you're able to gather the data to answer that question and slice and dice it, then maybe you've got something that can tell you about what to do next. Um, another question uh, for this, you know, every piece of software should go through an SSDLC. Um, how many of the software projects in the last 12 months have been reviewed and signed off? Um, how many of them haven't? Um, and then we can, again, slice and dice that according to risk ranking, technology stack, business unit, software project type, and hopefully zero in on areas that we want to focus on in the future. Or, 
you know, get some visibility into potentially glaring holes um, in our risk posture if we've decided that, you know, we want to live up to this risk management objective. What percentage of software projects in the last 12 months did not go through the secure SDLC? And then slice and dice. What percentage of software projects in the last 12 months have passed all software security checkpoints? So, you know, one example of software security checkpoints is that permit to build, permit to deploy gate, um, but, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds. Uh, what percentage of the applications have one or more open exceptions for not passing an S a secure SDLC gate? Uh, and I think this is the last one uh, for today's discussion. Uh, for each security checkpoint in the secure SDLC, what's the average percentage of artifacts provided versus expected for all the software projects in the last 12 months? So the point here is that for all of the 20 or so risk management objectives, you can come up with a bunch of questions to ask that are pretty specific. Um, and, you know, I'm not standing up here saying, these are the questions you should ask necessarily, you know, because that this might or might not be a risk management objective that applies to you. But for every objective, you can define a lot of questions and then you can begin to gather data to answer those questions. And that is sort of a methodology for creating metrics uh, that hopefully are meaningful and that you might be able to tell a story about because you can go in and you can say, look, good software, good, bad software, bad. How do we get to that state where we're, we're getting more good software and less bad software? You know, we're going to manage the risk by putting everything through a secure SDLC. How do we do that? You know, I'm asking five questions about it. You don't have to ask five. You could ask just one. Um, and, and then, and so it goes, you know, um, and as things change in the program, uh, so things change in the metrics. Um, and then you just, you just keep on doing it. Um, you know, every organization is going to have different risk management objectives and ask different questions about it. Um, but today what I was hoping to present was sort of a methodology and one example of how you might uh, do that. Um, we've thought through this a lot. We're actually in the process of building out a tool that has for each of these risk management objectives, you know, sort of all of the questions that you might ask um, and the various pieces of data that you might gather in order to answer the questions. So that, you know, if, if you're looking at one of these objectives and you're saying, yeah, that's something I want to do, and then you're looking at the questions and you're like, well, I'm not really able to answer them, then maybe that in of itself uh, is sort of marching orders to say, well, how do I put the processes in place to get the data to answer the question to meet this risk management objective? And that's all I've got. Um, it's, it's 40 after the hour, so we've got 10 minutes for Q&A if folks have anything that they want to talk about. Yep. So um, question is, um, you know, not every organization, I would say, let me flip that. Every organization has a different risk tolerance. What kind of questions can you ask your executives in order to figure out how they feel about what your risk tolerance ought to be? Um, so this list, and I think like all the slides are going to be provided, so you guys will have this list. This list is a decent place to start, you know, and you could kind of go through this list and say, are some of these like wildly out of our reach, in which case we're probably not going to get to them this year, you know, or some of them, maybe they are within our reach. Um, and, and the other way to do it would be to say for these, um, what I kind of call like metrics refinements per risk ranking, per tech stack, per business unit, per software project type, you know, maybe you choose a risk objective and you ask a question about it, but you're only focused on critical apps, you know, or you're only focused on this particular technology stack. Um, so there are ways to say it's impossible to boil the ocean and we can't do everything at once, but how do we start 
Um, and, then, and then the ways to do that would be to pick some risk management objectives and then decrease the scope um, by using these. And then I'd say, you know, how do you have that risk tolerance conversation with the executives? One way that I would recommend is, you know, out of these 20 or so risk management objectives, you know, you pick the three or the five, you know, that you think that you care about and that maybe your execs care about, and you say to them, do you care about these things? You know, and, and then maybe they do and maybe they don't. Um, and then, but, but then you have something to start on. You know, if you go into a conversation with your executives and you're like, so, where, you know, how, on a scale of one to 10, where's your risk tolerance? You know, that's, that's a hard thing for them to necessarily respond to in a productive way. Um, but if you take this list of 20, you know, and you pick three to five and you're like, you know, those really kind of resonate with me. Um, or I think resonate with my organization, and then you present it to them and you say, what do you think? Um, then maybe that's a good way to start the conversation. It seems like we still don't have a good sense of metrics that have a predictive value, right? Like, you know, how, how can these metrics that very easily to define yourself after them? Yes. Um, so can they help you get a better story as to like, why it should have happened so that you know, they did everything they should have done? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point, right? So these metrics are not predictive, um, you know, and I don't claim to be able to tell you, you know, who's going to win the Super Bowl. Um, so, you know, similarly, I don't claim to be able to tell you what kind of incident's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I think if any of us could do that, like we, I don't know if we'd be here today. You know, maybe we'd be doing something different um, because maybe we'd have like a ton of money and not have our day jobs. Um, so I think that's a good point, and I also think that that's, an opportunity for education, right? If your executive comes to you and says, why aren't you able to predict my next security incident, then that's um, something that you can respond and say, well, that's not possible. That, that's not quite what I was thinking. Predicting the likelihood of things, right? So watching yeah. hands, like, for instance, like there are studies that show washing your hands reduces the likelihood of infection. Yeah. Right? So we don't have many things like that. We don't even know if there's any better analysis of this. Right? Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think, yeah, you know, there's other industries like insurance or finance and they have all of these like quantitative models and they're like, we know that like, you know, one out of 20 drivers is going to do this dumb thing and that's why we charge this much for insurance. I think we're not that mature yet, um, but I also think we're not completely dumb, right? So there's lots of different ways to do that and I would actually go to our slide about um, various activities. You know, I think at a really high level, you know, it's proper to say that if you have controls in place versus if you don't have controls in place, if you have controls in place and those controls are good, you're probably in a better place than if you had zero control. So there's a coverage thing. Um, and, and there's a coverage thing you know, breadth-wise, so you could look at this. You could look at this page, and you could say, you know, I have a secure SDLC, SDLC with gates. I don't have a satellite. I don't have metrics. I don't do portfolio management. Well, you know, I do this. I don't do that. There's so there are these gap analyses approaches to say, you know, do I have controls coverage? Um, another way to do it is to say, maybe I take a, a threat and attack intelligence way of looking at it. You know, and I'm brainstorming different ways in which I could be attacked. You know, maybe I'm looking at companies that are like my company and I say, well, you know, who got attacked last week and, and how did that happen to them and am I, am I protected in that way? So I think we're not totally dumb about predicting if you have no security controls in place, you're likely to get attacked more than if you have some in place. You know, but the funny flip side for us is if you're not looking, maybe you don't know. So sometimes, you know, we meet with clients and, and as part of BSIM or, or whatever sort of interview data gathering thing we're doing, we say, you know, so what, how, do, how does a software security incident work for you? And they say to us, we've never had a software security incident. And we're like, okay, well maybe you don't have detective controls in place to know that you're being attacked because probably you are. Um, so there's this funny thing where we also don't know where we don't know. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a good answer for you. 
uh, unfortunately. But I do think it's a good question because um, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And I think if we could get there, that'd be really cool. But we don't, as an industry, have the data yet. We're not mature yet uh, to that point, I think. I think if we wanted to get there, and maybe OWASP is a cool platform for talking about something like this, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to say, well, if we all collected the same kind of metrics and then we put our data in a place, you know, then, then we'd have something. Um, so there's an organization, CIS, the Center for Internet Security, and they're the ones who do those host hardening standards. And maybe like five, six years ago, they tried to do that, actually. They, they said, hey, we're going to develop, you know, we're going to talk to like 70 people who think uh, information security metrics are interesting. Uh, and know something about it. And we're gonna put together these like 10 or so information security metrics. And they did, and it's available. You can Google CIS consensus metrics definitions. And there's a group of people, myself included, who tried to do that. And the idea was that if we could get, you know, all the organizations to, to gather these metrics, then maybe we could get to a point where they were all putting them in a place and then we could build these types of data sets. Um, but no one was interested, and I think the reason no one was interested was because these 10 metrics didn't apply to everyone, not at where they were um, you know, for their particular uh, maturity um, or, or what they were focusing on. So we're, we're just not there yet. We're like, we're new, you know, like how new is software and how new is it that software is used for everything? You know, it's pretty new still. Whereas insurance has been around for like a really long time and finance has been around for even longer than that. Yes. You get breached and they will pay something. But there are so many inter so, so you should read the fine print because there's like all these scenarios under which it doesn't apply. But yes. But so, so they they must have thought that they figured something <coughs> because they had to have some quantitative model to try to determine I the bet they didn't. I bet they didn't. I'm Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's kind of a con to be honest. That's just my personal take. <laughs> I know it's cool. I, I I will stand behind my opinion, but it's my personal opinion. Yeah, I, th I think that's an excellent point. I think if you sort of, you know, reduce the scope of the question, you know, instead of saying, like, predict the next security incident, you know, say, well, here's one specific type of bug. You know, the way in which it occurs is discrete, and we can sort of manage that, and we can sort of manage the various things. You know, we can, we can reduce the attack surface um, and so forth. I also think that in general, most application security organizations are not mature enough to where it's the best call to jump and try and do predictive metrics when most likely there are not very basic metrics such as coverage metrics, participation metrics, things like defect density, things like here's a plan, are we acting on that plan? Are we seeing any effectiveness from that plan? Um, my personal opinion is that predictive metrics are like really far out on the maturity curve and that I've seen very few organizations that are there. The insurance question is interesting. I'm pretty sure they have no data. And again, I will stand behind. I kind of think it's a con. Because there are so many loopholes, I bet they, I bet they like, hardly ever pay out. I bet they hardly ever pay out. Any other questions? This is fun. It's 3.50, so you can go if you want to. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you being here.